Thank you, Anna. Um, now, every time we open the scriptures, we need God's help to understand them. Sometimes, however, that's more obvious than others. So, shall I pray? Uh, gracious Father, we pray this morning that you would be with us uh, by your spirit. Open our eyes, unblock our ears. Give us understanding, we pray, uh, that we might understand these words of yours. Uh, give us insight. And may that understanding lead to transformation. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, do you want to know, do you want to experience God's power, the power of his spirit? Our text this morning is verse 29 of the passage in Galatians that was just read to us. And our theme is the spirit's power. Now, regulars will know that uh, in, uh, over the Sunday mornings this term, we're working through the book of Galatians and looking at every reference to the Holy Spirit in order to understand him better and experience his work. Galatians is a book that is all about Christian experience. So, for example, verse 29 now, the verse leading up to uh, our text is quite tricky, uh, the verses leading up to it. And it helps us, I think, at this point, to remember the situation that Paul is writing into. Basically, there's an argument going on in the Galatian churches, so uh, fairly similar, I guess, to many churches. But unlike arguments in many churches, this is a really important one that they get right. And the argument is all about Christian experience, what it's like to live as a Christian, and whether or not it's possible to be a second-class Christian. Now, some people were saying it was. Some people had come to these churches after Paul had left. Uh, they'd come up to Galatia from Jerusalem, where they considered the real action to be, and were in effect saying that these Galatians hadn't got things quite right, they were, and therefore they were missing out. In order to be the real deal, in order to join the ranks of true believers and experience the Spirit's power in its fullness, they needed to well follow the, their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, who were doing things slightly differently. And they wanted them to do things differently, do, in fact, as they were doing down in Jerusalem. Now, I wonder if you've ever had that experience, uh, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you've ever come across other believers who make you feel a little bit inferior because they imply, or perhaps they say directly, that you're missing out. And that in order to enter the full experience of being a Christian, you need to do things differently. In fact, do things, surprise, surprise, as they're doing them. That you'd be better off, that you'd be more proper, as it were. Well, this is a situation that's going on in Galatia. And it was, of course, a power play. Such conversations pretty much is always power play. And just to prove that to you, if you glance down chapter 4, verse 17, Paul says of these people, these visitors, who were teaching the Galatians nonsense, these people are jealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It was a power play. Well, Paul, though, has the measure of them, and he's writing to them to warn them of the dangers of taking their, the new teaching that was coming to them on board. How does he do that? Well, he does it two ways in the letter, and he does it two ways, the same two ways in our passage this morning. He says, look at what scripture says, and look at your experience, and consider one in the light of the other. Consider your experience in the light of what scripture says. So that's what we're going to do this morning, look at the experience he talks about and the scripture context that he puts it in. He wants them to reflect on their conversion to Christ in our verse 429. And he wants them to reflect on 
what the Old Testament teaches, verses 21 to 31, where he takes them back to Abraham, as he's done several times in the book, if you've been with us. Now, we're not going to be able to look at all the uh, details of it. That's an opportunity for us to do this evening at Jacob and Beth's house with Trinity. But basically, when he goes back to Abraham, he reminds them that Abraham had two wives, Hagar and Sarah, and two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and therefore two lots of descendants. And that will be significant in his argument. Two women, two sons, two lots of descendants. Uh, He says a bit more, but that's the thrust of it. But first, let's look at the experience that he wants to remind them of in verse 29. Actually, it's just part of the verse, isn't it? The experience of being born by the power of the Spirit. Paul once again looks at the work of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, in Christian beginnings. And the power of the Spirit, again, as it has been already in the letter, is linked with the experience of becoming a Christian. Not a subsequent act there at the beginning. So according to Paul, this powerful work of the Spirit is something that everyone needs. It's universally required. Everyone needs to be born again by the Spirit. Now, I haven't got the zapper, but if someone wants to zap onto the first pictures here, uh, I'm, I'm looking out at everyone. It's rather depressing for me to reflect on the fact that I was probably the only one here who lived through Watergate, the original Watergate um, gate. It's where we get the gate of party gate from. Every political crisis now has something gate at the end. That gate comes from the original Watergate um, crisis that led to the downfall of President Nixon. He's the one on the left. The other guy in the picture is a guy called Chuck Colson. He was one of President Nixon's aides at the time. And in the end, he went into prison for his involvement in the Watergate scandal. After uh, Watergate, after his time, or shortly after it, he became a Christian. And when he was released, he became involved in prison reform. And he wrote of his experience of becoming a Christian in a book called Born Again. Uh, It's sold millions. It's still in print if you want it. In fact, it was so uh, popular and caused such a stir at the time that the the term born again became a bit of a cliché. The idea became trivialised, as it always does with clichés. It was even used to try and sell sell the Renault Clio. That's how trivialised it became, a born-again car. However, the original use of the term in the New Testament that we saw that actually Jesus used in our first reading in John 3, it's a very profound idea. And the idea is that becoming a Christian is so radical, so transformative, so game-changing that you could liken it to being born again. And Paul knows the Galatians have had this experience of the new birth. All Christians do. All real believers know the power of the Spirit in this way. They have all, verse 29, been born of the Spirit. Now this coming to Christ, this conversion, this regeneration, this initial experience of the Spirit is described in the New Testament in lots of different ways. In fact, even in the book, as we've been going through it over these last few weeks, it's been described in various ways. As receiving the Spirit, as beginning with the Spirit, as God giving his Spirit, of God sending his Spirit into our hearts. We've seen that all of those over the last few weeks. It's also described in this book as being adopted as God's sons, being redeemed, being rescued, being baptized into Christ, being clothed with Christ, all talking of the same experience. And this experience is always linked in Galatians in the New Testament with individual repentance and faith. Now, those of us who are hope explored this last Wednesday just gone uh, looked at this idea, and I thought Rico Tice put it brilliantly, as he always does, of what repentance and faith means. 
Because he, he, they're sort of religiously type words, don't they? They're not words we usually use in this sense. He described repentance as acknowledgement of wrongdoing and turning back to God. He described faith as recognition of Jesus as king and crying out to him for rescue, trusting in his death. And such repentance towards God and faith in Jesus, with that becomes, comes forgiveness from God. Repentance, faith, forgiveness. They're of a peace. And they're the distinct blessing of the post-Pentecostal church. It's a powerful work of God by his spirit. So don't turn to it, but those of you who know that Peter's words at Pentecost uh, in that sermon, remember at the end of it, listen to his words at the end of his sermon on the day of Pentecost. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance towards God, faith in Christ, forgiveness, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, they're all of a piece. Well, to switch things around a bit, there is no other way by which the Holy Spirit can be received other than by repentance towards God and faith in Christ. If we think we can achieve that any other way, then we haven't really appreciated the position we're in, the mess we're in, the problem we face, and how powerless we are to address it. You see, if you think humankind's fundamental problem is ignorance, what will you do? Well, you'll put all your efforts into education, won't you? Or telling people what they should do. They don't know, you tell them. If you think humankind's basic problem is economic, then you, where, where will you put your hope? You'll put it in some sort of political system. But our problem, according to the scripture, the Bible, is not economic, it's not ignorance, it's not lack of knowledge. It's that knowing God, we've rejected him. And that's put us in a big fix. We were alive, but in rejecting him, we've become dead. And we need to be reborn. We were free, but now we're enslaved and need to be set free. Which is what verse 29 is all about. It's what Jesus taught, that something much more radical than political reform or education is required, something much more humbling, actually. Humbling because we contribute nothing. What is required is nothing less than a mighty act of God by his spirit. More rules, more laws, more education, a bit of social action, they won't achieve it. What is needed is, verse 29, new birth. New birth into a new age, a new realm by the power of the Spirit. So remember the reading we had earlier from John 3, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus? I mean, he was one of the most educated men of his time. Yet he was completely clueless, wasn't he? about what was required to enter the kingdom of God. He was Israel's teacher. He should have known. The Old Testament told him, but he just missed it. Now, those words, born again in John 3, can be rendered as born from above. To be a Christian is to be born from above, born by the power of the Spirit. It's his work that gives us birth. It's his work that gives us life. Turning new leaf does not do it. Trying a bit harder does not do it. Going to church, religious ritual, that doesn't do it. None of the, any of that can make anyone Christian. What is required is the work of the Spirit. Because becoming a Christian is not becoming a member of a new club. It is new life. 
it is being born again. It is becoming part of God's family. So everyone here this morning who's a Christian, your conversion to Christ was a miraculous, powerful work of God's spirit. And if we doubt that, and I think sometimes we do, I think we sometimes think we must look elsewhere for some mighty act of God at work, some evidence of his power. But if we do, I think it's probably because we've forgotten or perhaps never even appreciated just what a fix we were in and just what was required to get us out of it. One cross-reference to turn to this morning. Uh, I haven't let someone shout out the page number. It's Colossians 1. Uh, chapter, what, cha- uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. So forward a few pages. Where we get another description of this powerful act of God. You see, Paul is again describing this work of God to the Colossians this time. What he has done in Christ. How he has been at work. And picking it up at verse 12, he encourages them to rejoice. To give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified them to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Paul says, look, he's qualified you to be one of his people, to join the people of God, to share in the inheritance. How's he done that? What's he done? Verse 13, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. So do you see how this new birth is described here? What the power of the Spirit has achieved in bringing us to Christ? He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. We were enslaved, but now we have been rescued. This word dominion is a bit of an old-fashioned word, isn't it? It's... um, It sort of means authority or mastery or control. He says, you were under the mastery, the dominion, the control of evil, of darkness. That's strong words, isn't it? To be under evil's command, its direction, its power, its rule. And I think it's true that generally we don't, people don't see themselves that way, do they? As enslaved, as trapped. The next slide shows a picture of Catherine Burble Singh. I I don't know if anyone knows her. Uh, She's the social mobility czar. She she hit the press a few in the run-up to Christmas, a month or so beforehand, and got all sorts of trouble uh, on Twitter. Where else do you get into trouble on? Uh, But not only on Twitter, in mainstream media. uh, And people were calling for her to lose her job and all sorts of things. Why? Because she talked about the idea of original sin. Now, she's not a Christian herself, and she, it was almost a throwaway comment, but her critics, who were demanding her sack, demanding that she lose a job, wanted to insist that people are born good, and that it's trauma, poverty, negative influences of adults that drive folk to negative behaviour. Well, that's not the evidence of scripture and nor indeed of history, I don't think. Final account. It's a film coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, it's an, uh, it was filmed over 10 years. A whole series of interviews uh, of people who were involved, some of them peripherally, some of them, some of them more centrally, in some of the uh, grievous crimes of the 20th century, uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, these people are now in their 80s and 90s, and they're interviewed, most of the interviews are done in their front living room, so they look a bit like um, you know, our parents, our grandparents. As the, the, fil- the edit film, uh, the guy who made the film or edited the document together was interviewed this week, and he was asked what feeling he got when he heard all their stories, and he edited it together, and his comments were interesting. He said, It was deeply disturbing, but almost entirely unsurprising. So normal, so understandable. 
how people got themselves into the mess. Because, and he didn't say this, but scripture says there is a deep problem in all our hearts. We all have potential for huge evil and wickedness because we're under evil's dominion, naturally. Uh, We might be able to conceal it from others for a while, even from ourselves, but in the right context, it will out. The witness of scripture, the witness of history is clear. We are trapped, enslaved in the realm of darkness from which well, rescue is our only hope. And that rescue doesn't require just a gentle bit of encouragement, a, a gentle nudge, a small, uh, a small act on our part. It requires the mighty act of God, a rebirth, a new start. And God has given us that That involved us in his mighty act of deliverance that's what was required the mighty power of the spirit I just turn back to Galatians with you um, where these believers these Christians they have experienced this mighty act and power of God in their experience but as we've seen already not everyone is rejoicing with them some folk, uh, some Jewish believers from Jerusalem, they acknowledge them they're real believers, but they just think something's missing, something else needs to be done. They're not quite the real deal. Yeah, okay, they put their trust in Christ, they are believers, but they're not really true sons of Abraham, not really, which when push comes to shove means they're not members of God's people, not really. And they wouldn't be, these folk argued, until they took on some of the obligations that they considered came with true sonship, unless they submitted to some of the Jewish ways of doing things. Because, you know, Jewish believers, after all, they're the proper descendants of Abraham, aren't they? They argued. And if these Galatian Christians wanting to be proper members of God's people, fully paid up, sons and daughters of God, well, they needed to do as they were doing, they argued. Embrace their traditions. Do things their way. They were being spiritual snobs, really. We're used to snobbery, aren't we, sadly? It happens individually. It happens at the institutional level. The Roman Catholic's official position is that all Protestant churches are second-class Christians. They're what they call separated brethren. They're Christians, they would acknowledge. And they would be welcomed back into the bosom of Mother Church if they adopt its practices and submit to its authority. A power play. Pretty much the idea going on here. Believing in Jesus is fine, but more is needed. You must do things our way to be proper. Paul will have none of it, do you see? He says you're free. You're free of any such obligation to anyone. To add to Christ, to add to faith in Christ, any form, any legalism, any obligation is an anathema to him. It's abhorrent because it destroys the gospel. To add to the gospel is to subtract. To add anything to faith in Christ as being necessary is to destroy the gospel. And so he says, chapter five, verse one, don't do it. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, don't listen to them. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. To submit to any authority, or the authority of these Jewish believers from Jerusalem would be to return, return to slavery. Don't do it, he says. Actually, he says a bit more than that in verses 21 to 31, um, but that's the nub of it. Um, I was going to spend some time looking at Hagar and Ishmael and stuff, but I don't think I will because I don't want us to lose the main point, the thrust of it. 
Don't be intimidated by those who want to add something to Christ. Don't be bullied. Don't be dismayed. Don't think of yourself as lesser than anyone else, your experience as lesser than anyone else. You have been redeemed. You have been rescued. You have experienced the power of the Spirit. Stop thinking yourself as less than anyone. Stop it. Don't do it. So two takeaways this morning. First is for you, if you're a Christian believer here this morning, if you've heard about Jesus and what he's done for you, his death in your place, if you've been humbled before the cross, if you turn back to God in repentance and are trusting in Christ for rescue, for redemption, for forgiveness, know this, will you? You have been the recipient of, you have, been, you have experienced a mighty work of the Spirit of God in your life. You have been born again by the power of the Spirit, rescued from the dominion of darkness, brought into the kingdom of his Son. Rejoice! And be thankful. And if you're ever tempted to think that there must be something else, that you're second class, that there's something you must do, some experience of the Spirit you must have to be a bona fide believer, then will you hear Paul's message to you this morning? God's message to you this morning? There isn't. There's nothing to be added. Nothing else to be done. You are Abraham's seed. You have inherited the promises. You are a true child of God. Don't be confused. Don't be misled. Stand firm. Don't let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And the second takeaway for you, if you're not a Christian believer here this morning, if you know that's not where you're standing... Can you take this to heart this morning? Take this away with you? No, there is nothing you can do to save yourself. You cannot rescue yourself from the dominion of darkness. Try it. You won't do it. You cannot rescue yourself from the current evil age. You cannot save yourself for the life to come. Know for certain, as eggs as eggs, you can't do it. But by the power of his spirit, God can. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, thank you so much for Paul's clarity. That salvation, that redemption, that rescue, that membership of your people depends not on anything we can do but on faith in Christ's work for us alone. Heavenly Father, thank you that so many of us here this morning know that work, powerful work of the Spirit in our lives. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that our confidence would remain there uh, and that any that don't have that confidence might come to it uh, because of Christ's work for them. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.